frying is used more than any other method in this country. Shallow frying, that is. Not so many home cooks use this deep frying. Some fried foods, chips for example, can only be cooked really well in deep fat or oil. I'm using a two-heat method. Notice the oil is hardly bubbling at all. This test is to see that the oil is comparatively cool. The object is to cook the chips right through first without browning them. In about five minutes they will become quite soft. Then they are left to drain while the fat gets much hotter. This is a good test for the second cooking temperature. The bread should quickly become golden, but not burn. Now the chips go into the hot fat for about three minutes to crisp and color the outer surfaces. You can do the entire cooking in the hotter oil, but it's not so easy to avoid a burned outside with the center uncooked and hard. Whichever method you use, one thing is most important. Always dry the raw chips thoroughly before you put them into hot fat. If they're left wet, this may happen. Remember, if fat does catch fire, put a lid on the pan. Don't ever use water. It will make matters much worse. I do hope I haven't put you off deep fat frying. It needn't be dangerous or messy. If it does spill over, just wipe the top of the cooker with warm soapy water as soon as you can. Now there are one or two other points worth remembering. As soon as cooking oil is cold, strain it through muslin into a container with a lid. The object is to remove solid particles that would burn next time you cooked. Oil doesn't absorb liquids, they evaporate off. If you use solid fat for deep frying, you need not strain it. As soon as it's cold, you'll find all the crumbs have sunk to the bottom. You can use deep frying fat over and over again because it seals the food so quickly that it never picks up their flavor. It's very economical. Occasionally you may have to top up, but even with frequent use, it will go on for months. Deep fat is ideal for batter-coated foods. And here is a good batter mixture. Add a little olive oil to the seasoned or sweetened flour. The water should be warm, not cold. At this stage, keep the mixture rather thicker than you'll eventually want, because you will thin it by adding white of egg whipped until it's stiff. Fold it in, of course. Don't stir. Now it's ready for the main ingredients. When you're frying them, don't use a basket. The batter tends to stick to it. Spoon the crisp pieces out onto draining paper. Most people use shallow frying a great deal. And probably you may think that it's so simple. There's not much point in talking about it. But a lot of cooks don't fry as well as they could. Don't use too much fat. That's more than enough. It's only there to stop the food sticking to the pan. But let it do its job. Adding an egg too soon like this is really wasting the unmelted butter. There's no hurry. Fry slowly. Our camera has speeded up both egg and timer. In real life, it takes about four minutes. This is the way I do an egg and breadcrumb coating. Really cover with egg. This is important. This puts the crumbs where they're wanted and keeps the coating even on both sides. The pan should be quite hot at first. That sets the egg yolk, but then lower the flame. Remember, cook slowly and don't overcrowd the pan. You can keep fillets hot in the oven while you do the next one. The crumpled paper drains off excess fat. Uneven cooking like this is often the result of not moving the pan. Keep shaking it like this. The French call it sauté. It means to jump, hence sauté potatoes.
there were jumps during cooking. In England, braised dishes are sometimes called sautés. Foreign technical terms often become confused in translation, but even English cooking phrases can be misleading. A butcher sells frying steak, and what do we do? We grill it. But what about this? Get a thick iron pan, very hot. Don't add any fat. Meanwhile, season a good thick steak. The garlic isn't necessary, but I like it. If the pan is really hot, the meat won't stick. It only needs a few seconds to sear each side. Don't attempt to cook it right through, just colour the surface. Next, put the steak into a fireproof dish and paint it with melted butter. Set your oven thermostat to mark six. And put the dish in the oven for about four minutes. A little longer if you prefer well done steak. I don't know whether to call it fried or roasted, but that's the result. An even pink right the way through. Here's a bacon tip. Notice I'm resting the lean of each rasher on the fat of the one before. The fat and rind cooks much more than the lean, which is protected from the direct heat of the pan. The rind becomes like crackling on roast pork, so it needn't be cut off. Try it for yourself. Turn the rashers so that again, the less cooked lean rests on the crisper fat. Incidentally, this was dry frying. I didn't add any extra cooking fat. It's used for many oily foods. Excellent for herring. I've put mustard in the crisscross cuts. Try it yourself. It adds a lot to the flavour. Because dry frying extracts fat, it's good for pork chops. Don't only think of frying for savoury things, it's excellent for sweets as well. Try this, slicing a banana lengthways and rolling it in sugar. Heat butter to the foaming stage, then add the sliced fruit. It won't need much frying, just enough to melt the sugar. Thick cream makes this dish a real luxury one. They say some cooks live in a frying pan, and you can't blame them when you think of the range of fried foods, sweet and savoury. Of course, no meal should consist entirely of dishes cooked by any one method, and it's as well not to fry every day. Nevertheless, it's probably the quickest way to rustle up something tasty. Good frying depends upon easily adjustable heat, and the modern cook has just that, always ready to serve and to obey.